Hi folks, uh, Dr. Dicek, uh, continuing tonight with our educational forum on COVID and other healthcare matters. Uh, tonight, I want to bring you some good news. Uh, I think it's good news and um, uh, it's, uh, it's exciting because uh, I uh, got this directly from the Mount Sinai team that um, we've been working with uh, recently on the question of antibodies, understanding the antibody mechanisms and the question of reinfections. Remember, we discussed this a couple of weeks ago, and as I discussed uh, at that time, uh, any question on issues of reinfection uh, need to be referred to centers that best understand this issue, uh, those that are research-oriented, and as everything in science, we have to follow the science and follow the data, trust it and verify it, and then move on. Uh, so I've been in uh, close touch with some of the folks at Mount Sinai, actually one of the individuals who's a phenomenal uh, clinician and researcher, Dr. Viviana Simon, has been very helpful uh, in um, getting us uh, 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 ways to enroll people in this program quickly, in this research program, uh, and she's been so helpful in just helping me and those of us who are watching this understand the immune responses. So I want to speak about a preprint that uh, has just come out, and this is fresh off the press, and it's very exciting news and good news. Uh, and then I'm going to cover uh, a CDC recommendation with, with the guidelines that came out just yesterday, July 22nd. Uh, so the Mount Sinai study on antibodies has been headed up by uh, Dr. Weinberg at Mount Sinai, who's run the largest antibody study in the world, to my knowledge. Uh, they studied almost 20,000 patients uh, with mild to moderate COVID disease, back is going back as far as March. Uh, and what they discovered and now are reporting, which is the exciting news, is that the majority of people who develop mild to moderate COVID disease, in fact, had very good IgG responses. Those are the antibody responses to the viral spike protein. 90% uh, of the people who got sick, even with mild disease, uh, seroconverted to develop uh, these antibodies. Uh, and the vast majority of them developed what we call detectable neutralizing antibodies, which are the real antibodies that help you not only fight infection, but hopefully prevent infection in the future if they can stick around. Uh, and they reported that uh, the 90% of people who seroconverted, that those antibodies stuck around for at least three months. They could at least comment on the three months. Now, this is in dispute to the study by Dr. Long, which was reported several weeks back, uh, which said that 40% of people lost their IgG immunity within an 80-day period. Uh, in science, this is what happens. Sometimes you have conflicting studies and then we have to go further and, and, and study it even more. So it's important to understand, this paper speaks about it, you have to understand the difference between simple titers and functional antibodies, antibodies that kill the virus or neutralizing antibodies. So at Mount Sinai, they used a uh, assay called the ELISA enzyme uh, uh, assay to measure titers. Now it's very important, and, and Dr. Simon, who I've been in touch with for Mount Sinai, I emphasize this over and over. Not all titers are of equal quality. Uh, many of the antibody tests that are being done in labs throughout the country uh, have different quality controls. They measure different parts of the antibody response, and quite frankly, many of them pick up responses from old coronaviruses or beta coronaviruses, which cross-react with the current COVID-19 uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we're basing uh, this information strictly on the Mount Sinai antibody study uh, and the reliability of their ELISA test, which is very good. Um, so their ELISA test measured antibody levels anywhere from 1 to 80 to 1 to 160 to 1 to 320, 1 to 960, and up to 1 to 2880, 2880. In order to have donated plasma for convalescent plasma donation through the Mount Sinai program, an individual would have had to achieve an antibody titer of 1 to 320. So in other words, if you had a 1 to 320 titer on the Mount Sinai uh, titer uh, ELISA system, you could donate plasma. So what did they identify? What percentage of people had how much antibody? About 2.5% had the 1 to 80 titer, which was low. About 4.7% had the 1 to 160 titer, which was still considered low. But the truly valuable titer of 1 to 320, about 22% of individuals uh, who they studied had achieved the 1 to 320 titer. That was considered high. 
32% achieved 1 to 960, very high, and 38% of the individuals achieved 1 to 2880, very high as well. So almost 70% uh, of individuals had the very high achievement titers, which was very exciting news. Uh, now, in the individuals who had low antibody titers in the 80 to 160 range, only half of them produced those neutralizing antibodies. But everybody who had titers over 1 to 320, every, well, 90% of people who had uh, titers over 1 to 320 had neutralizing antibody activity. That's the good, valuable antibodies. And in the people who had over 960, 100% of them developed those valuable neutralizing antibodies. Uh, so the theory is that the quality antibodies uh, uh, that sustain are actually originated in the plasma cells in the bone marrow. There are cells there called plasma cells. They are very long-lived cells. They live and get released from the bone marrow. And those cells produce very valuable neutralizing antibodies. So the theory is that uh, if we could just measure plasma cell activity, that would be where these antibodies were most likely produced. Uh, what they did comment on, I'm going to quote directly from the article, they said, it is still not clear if infection with SARS-CoV-2 in humans protects from reinfection and for how long. So, in other words, they were saying that we do believe that at least for a three-month period, there is very good reason to believe you do not get reinfected. Beyond three months, they haven't studied yet, and that's where they're going now with the further studies, which is great news, because at least we know now that for 90% of the people who had mild to moderate disease, they do have some protective uh, element from those antibodies, which is great news. Uh, they also have a partial, a non-human primate model in monkeys, I believe they were macaw monkeys, uh, where there was no reinfection, at least for a period of time. We don't know how long that was, but it's assumed to be somewhere around three months. So the program's gonna now continue to follow these very important um, patients for a period of uh, another three to six months and remeasure their neutralizing antibodies uh, and eventually see if these people can fight off infection in the future. Uh, I'm gonna read a quote from the article. It says, quote, while this cannot provide conclusive evidence that these antibody responses protect from reinfection, we believe it is very likely that they will decrease the odds of getting reinfected and may attenuate disease in case of breakthrough infection. Uh, this study also will assist greatly in vaccine development now because now we can understand whether a vaccine produces these valuable neutralizing antibodies that Mount Sinai has been following. So it's good news because at least it gives us a three month window from the Mount Sinai study, which is by far the largest number to date. Uh, showing that it is fairly unlikely to get reinfection during that three-month window. Uh, it is extremely important not to uh, uh, take that to the next level and say we don't get reinfection for the next six or nine months. Clearly, we don't know that yet. That's what the future data will produce, but by that time, hopefully, we'll have a vaccine which will help us get through. So it's really good news, and as I said initially when we spoke about reinfections, this is what real science is. You investigate, you bring it to the people who are best able to investigate it and those who are trained to investigate these problems. And then we make determinations. And this study, this early study out of Mount Sinai from Dr. Weinberg's group is absolutely great news and I think we should all celebrate it. Um, I wanna talk about um, the CDC yesterday. I'm gonna post this, uh, put out a, um, uh, a um, <clears throat> guidance on duration of isolation and precautions with adults who, who are COVID positive, and really what it is is really a summary of some, a lot of the research that's been going on in recent months. But basically, the the paper is very interesting. It put out, it made the distinction between finding virus that lives in the nasopharyngeal passage or in the respiratory tract uh, that's replication competent, meaning it can infect other people and cause further disease, and those that are not replication competent. And what it found basically, and it's really uh, a multi-finding uh, paper, and, and there are many bullet points on it. But basically, it's showing that individuals can continue to shed virus intermittently for up to 12 weeks after uh, infection. And it makes it very challenging to figure out what's real and what's not. Uh, it also makes the reinfection issues very challenging to figure out. Um, but basically, it points to, and I'm going to read from one of the bullet points, uh, that specimens uh, from patients who recovered from initial COVID-19 illness and subsequently developed new symptoms 
and retested positive by PCR did not have replication competent virus detected. That comes out of the Korean CDC. Uh, and it says the risk of reinfection may be lower in the first three months after initial infection based on limited evidence from another beta coronavirus. Those are the benign beta coronaviruses, uh, the genus to which the SARS-CoV-2 virus belongs. So what this paper is basically agreeing with the Mount Sinai paper that at least we have a three month window that we believe reinfection is highly unlikely. And I think that's very good news. Uh, it also went on to um, speak about some other things, but specifically the last bullet point was uh, that serologic or other correlates of immunity have not yet well been established. So the CDC is telling us, yes, it's likely that we're going to find a lot of dead virus or a lot of replication incompetent virus, so it can't really infect. But when I spoke to Dr. Simon uh, in the last few days for Mount Sinai, I asked her that question specifically. I wanted it to hear it directly from her. Uh, and I said to her, what do we do with these cases where people uh, now are uh, showing up sick, uh, PCR positive, maybe they were PCR negative a few weeks back or a few months back. And her answer was very interesting because it shows you where the scientists are at. She said, the only question that should be asked is if I am found to be PCR positive, am I assumed to be infectious if I'm now re-exposed? And the answer that she gave is you should assume you are infectious because you don't want to make a mistake and infect somebody who can't afford to be infected. So I think it's very bad for us to be <clears throat> checking PCRs or checking uh, uh, tests on, on individuals who are suspected to have exposures and then ignoring the results. We should not be doing that. We're going to reinfect a lot of people if we ignore results that are given to us. In other words, if you're exposed to an individual uh, and then you are found to be PCR positive, no matter what your experience was four months ago, you should not be re-exposing anybody else. You should be isolating for uh, a period of time, anywhere from seven to 10 days, and uh, obviously quarantine for family members as well. Uh, the other thing that the Mount Sinai researchers emphasize is this data is so important because it emphasizes the point that we must continue to wear masks right now. If you look at the experience in the New York area, thank God we're at a record low for cases now in the tri-state area. That is great news. Uh, the number of cases I'm told in Deal over the last week since we reported last have come down significantly. That's great news as well. Uh, unfortunately, the news is not great in the southern United States and Florida. Obviously, they're having a terrible time right now. But the CDC has specifically emphasized now that the use of masks, Dr. Redfield said this yesterday, if we have universal use of masks in the United States for the next six to 10 weeks, we can wipe out this virus to the point where we can get back to really where we want to be as a society. I think it's critical that we all wear masks at this point when leaving our homes. I think we need universal cooperation on that, and I think most Americans agree with me on that. So let's finish off to tonight. I'm, I'm excited about this news. I think uh, it's important to understand that, thank God, right now, within that three-month window, we don't believe there's any reinfection uh, likelihood. Um, they're going to study this now for the next three to six months to see if those patients, in fact, can sustain their neutralizing antibodies. And hopefully this is good news for everybody and for the world. And it's also great news because it'll assist us again in understanding immunity and making sure we're making the right vaccine. So I want to uh, wish everybody a good night with this good report and, and hopefully we'll continue to bring these to you. Have a good night.